Okay, let's start the second session. My name is Sokun Hong at Sejong General Hospital. Coach uh, Eisen will be here soon, I expect. The first, I will introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Dr. Fisher. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. He'll talk about the implant technique, implant surgical aspect of Elvat implantation. Thank you. My name is Wade Fisher. I'm a cardiac surgeon at, uh, at Hahnemann. I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, I was here last year and enjoyed the experience and was very happy to be invited back uh, for another opportunity. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to talk, uh, last year I talked a lot about short-term devices uh, which have been touched on. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the implant uh, for durable VADs and uh, I'm going to uh, skip over some of the material that's already been covered and uh, try and concentrate on, um, on the uh, surgical uh, aspects themselves. Uh, my disclosures, I'm a member of the uh, Physicians Advisory Board uh, for Abiumed, and uh, I am a very biased surgeon, and so uh, all, I warn you ahead of time, uh, not uh, like many surgeons, who use the literature for uh, support rather than illumination, uh, I will be giving you uh, a lot of my opinions. Now, on, uh, there have been a number of uh, trials that have been discussed, uh, the Momentum 3 regarding HeartMate 3, uh, Endurance Trial, uh, Revive It, uh, the um, uh, Roadmap, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, HeartMate 2, Heartware, uh, trials, rematch trial, and I'm going to be making some uh, general comments uh, regarding uh, those trials without necessarily specifically referencing them. So the surgeon's toolbox as a uh, uh, heart failure surgeon, uh, the gold standard has uh, been transplant, uh, mechanical circulatory support, including ECMO, LVADs, BIVADs, and total artificial heart and then high-risk uh, conventional uh, surgery in the heart failure patient, including coronary bypass valve repair replacement. Uh, today, we're going to, uh, I'm going to concentrate on VADs. Uh, here is a uh, uh, transplant uh, the team uh, is doing at uh, Hahnemann. And so this is an operation, as uh, Dr. Eisen uh, alluded to, that we're probably uh, perhaps going to be doing less of or relatively less compared to the number of VADs we're going to be doing. So uh, options for mechanical support include the uh, temporary uh, devices that have uh, been touched on and uh, as well as the permanent ones that uh, you've also uh, seen. So here uh, again is a picture of the HeartMate 2. There it is uh, uh, in uh, an x-ray in situ and a schematic. Now, the HeartMate 2, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about the different devices and you know, what are the considerations for when, when would we use one or another. Now, the HeartMate 2 has a long track record of success, and uh, another aspect of it is it appears to tolerate increased afterload or hypertension uh, better than the uh, hardware HVAD. Uh, but there are issues uh, with the HeartMate 2. Uh, it has a higher rate of thrombosis, the abdominal pocket position can shift, causing inflow cannula displacement, and it requires a transdiaphragmatic placement of the inflow cannula. And I think uh, some of those, uh, the shifting uh, issue may be something that leads to thrombosis as it changes uh, the inflow uh, cannula position. Here's a picture you've seen of the hardware HVAD. There is a schematic of it uh, in uh, position. And there is also a picture of an MVAD, which really hasn't been used in clinical trial next to the HVAD. Now, something I'll mention uh, that's been also alluded to is the hardware HVAD is a centrifugal pump. The HeartMate 2 is an axial flow pump. The HeartMate 3 is a centrifugal pump. 
the Jarvik and the MVADs are axial pumps. They're all continuous uh, flow pumps. So disadvantages of the HVAD, uh, it seemed to have an increased incidence of stroke compared to HeartMate 2, but it also has uh, been re-engineered from uh, the initial trial, and the stroke rate seems to be more in line with that of the HeartMate 2 now. It is less tolerant of uh, afterload of hypertension, and so we have to be fairly aggressive about treating uh, hypertension in these patients. It is not yet FDA approved for destination therapy, but we uh, have used it extensively as a destination therapy device as an off-label use of an FDA-approved device. This is a picture of the HeartMate 3. Looks uh, a lot like the, heart, uh, like the hardware. Uh, and in the initial, uh, in the Momentum trial, uh, it had both a uh, lower rate of stroke and thrombosis than the HeartMate 2. Uh, disadvantage is not yet FDA approved and uh, there is uh, limited experience with it, although in Europe it is being used more extensively. Here's a picture of the Jarvik. Uh, again, there's a Jarvik imposition. Uh, this device was designed to go to the descending aorta. So the advantages of, uh, of the Jarvik is that it's an intraventricular device. It has a post-auricular drive line that allows showering and swimming in a low infection rate. It has an intermittent controller that allows the LV to eject to prevent aortic root thrombosis. So it allows routine placement of the outflow graft to the descending aorta. And that allows you to place it uh, just through a thoracotomy. There's a picture of the, uh, the post-auricular uh, uh, driveline placement. Now, the disadvantage is it's not FDA approved, so it's available uh, only in clinical trial uh, in the U.S. So for the durable LVEDs, there is no best pump. Patient factors, surgeon preference, and clinical trial randomization determine device selection. The artificial designation of bridge to transplant uh, or destination therapy, I think, will not continue. In Europe, uh, there are patients who need mechanical support and patients uh, who do not. And so the, whether or not they're a transplant candidate is not taken into consideration at the time of device placement. Then after device placement, if the patient is considered a appropriate candidate for transplant, they can be listed for transplant. And it's interesting in the uh, Momentum trial, uh, the HeartMate 3 trial, they're uh, both patients for DT and uh, bridge therapy were included in that trial. So now uh, the direction uh, that I've been going uh, for placement of durable LVADs has been that of a sternal sparing LVAD placement. I've done it uh, through left thoracotomy and hemisternotomy. I've done it through left thoracotomy and right parasternal incision. I've done it through uh, bilateral thoracotomies and I've done it through a left thoracotomy alone. Now, you can do a HeartMate 2 through a sternal sparing uh, in, uh, approach, but it really is not designed for it. The uh, hardware HVAD is much more amenable to that approach, as is the Jarvik. So here, uh, you can see some of the anatomic landmarks. Uh, we. Um, We'll do a left thoracotomy in all of these uh, patients. Uh, we will do uh, a right thoracotomy through uh, generally the fourth inner space uh, for uh, a um, bi uh, bilateral thoracotomy approach. And uh, what we'll do is uh, for that or a parasternal approach, if it's a redo uh, or even if it's a non-redo, we'll tunnel uh, will bluntly tunnel the uh, outflow graft along the diaphragmatic surface of the uh, ventricle uh, and bring it out the right side. The, um, uh, when we do a hemisternotomy, we can tunnel the outflow graft either along the diaphragmatic surface and around to the ascending aorta or directly through the left side to the uh, aorta. Uh, a, in order to determine the uh, best position for your left thoracotomy, you can use ultrasound to determine exactly where the apex is. Often in these patients, 
you can feel uh, the pulse of maximal, the point of maximal impulse uh, just by uh, palpating the, uh, the left uh, chest, in which case you don't really need uh, to do ultrasound. This shows a left thoracotomy for the HVAD. Uh, for uh, positioning of the HVAD uh, and placement of the inflow cannula, you need to uh, use a uh, torque wrench. Now here they have the torque wrench being directed through the uh, thoracotomy. Sometimes you need to make a separate counter incision uh, in order to place it either uh, through the um, uh, a left uh, thoracotomy uh, up higher or through a subxiphoid incision. And here you can see uh, the subxiphoid uh, counter incision. Now you'll also uh, need to tunnel uh, the drive line prior to uh, placing the uh, device inside the uh, chest. And uh, you have to really plan out uh, your steps uh, for, this, uh, for this approach. This shows the uh, uh, parasternal or anterior thoraconomy approach. Uh, here they outline where you can make a heart may 2 incision. I've, I've not used these uh, uh, approaches for the heart may 2. Um, the uh, issue uh, also with the heart may 2 is you need to uh, place the inflow cannula through the diaphragm, uh, which uh, can cause morbidity in your COPD patients. And again, the abdominal uh, pocket can lead uh, to shifting over time and repositioning of the inflow cannula. So I, I really do this primarily for the hardware HVADs. I think this approach will be doable for the HeartMate 3s. I've not had the opportunity to use the HeartMate 3s as yet, though. Uh, now here uh, you can uh, see the uh, outflow graft uh, going to the ascending aorta. Uh, sometimes uh, you can use a tie or a clamp to hold the uh, right atrial appendage out of your way. Uh, and this is also uh, uh, a good approach uh, for redos. If you're doing a redo in a patient who's had multiple uh, previous sternotomies and bypasses, sometimes the uh, right thoraconomy approach is better because it allows you to approach the aorta through uh, a non-scarred area of the aorta and where you don't have grafts uh, coming off of it. Now, I call this a sternal sparing, not minimally invasive approach because there's really nothing minimally invasive about placing an LVAD. Uh, I think early experience in using this approach suggests that uh, you'll have better RV function by not disrupting the uh, pericardial well. Uh, even in uh, redos, you'll have less bleeding because you're not reopening the sternotomy. And you actually have more accurate inflow cannula placement because you're not lifting the heart up as you are in a sternotomy in order to position uh, your inflow cannula. You're actually looking at the, the ventricle through uh, the thoraconomy with the heart uh, really in situ. Now you can uh, uh, do these uh, uh, minimally invasive approaches off pump. I've done the Jarvik uh, uh, off pump. Uh, in general, uh, the, that approach is shied away from because of the risk of uh, having uh, ventricular muscle uh, that can get entrained into the, uh, into the inflow cannula of either a Jarvik or an HVAD if you don't take a minute to look inside the ventricle and be sure it's clear. It also gives you the opportunity to make sure when you're on pump that you don't have any clot in the LV that may have been missed by echo. So uh, in general, I will do uh, a short pump run, uh, but you can do it uh, off pump. So your indications, you know, the, the reason that I, I think it is worth doing minimally invasively, uh, in addition to uh, the potential for improved RV function, is that uh, for bridge to transplant, you can save the sternotomy for the transplant and uh, save time uh, in uh, doing a reduced sternotomy. Uh, for patients who have had previous sternotomies, I think they're significantly less bleeding. So that uh, I think there are advantages in both the uh, bridge patients and in the, the redo patients. Now one group uh, 
and I'm not sure if there's any advantages if you're doing a destination therapy patient that has a virgin chest. I think uh, in that case, I will generally just go ahead and do that patient through a sternotomy. Uh, the other group of uh, patients uh, are those that uh, I anticipate I'm going to have to do a concomitant operation. Now, uh, we've, uh, a couple of uh, the discussants have talked about aortic insufficiency uh, and uh, the approach to that. I don't like doing uh, the park stitch or sewing the aortic valve together. Uh, I prefer doing a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement in those patients. And the reason is that if you do have any uh, device failure and you've sewn the aortic valve shut, now you have no native backup. So I, I think it is worth taking the time uh, in order to do uh, uh, aortic valve replacement rather than just sewing it shut. I've gone back and forth about tricuspid valve repairs. Uh, in the past, if a uh, male had a 40 millimeter uh, diameter uh, tricuspid uh, annulus, I will go ahead and put a ring on. In women, if it was 38 millimeters, I'd put a ring on regardless of the uh, degree of regurge. But uh, anecdotally, I, I'm not sure that it's really uh, necessarily helped. I think that frequently the dilated uh, aortic valves are reflection, or tricuspid valves are really a reflection of dilated RVs. And I don't know that we really impact uh, outcomes long-term by doing uh, tricuspid valve surgery. Uh, in uh, similar fashion that uh, the uh, old uh, bowling annuloplasties in the heart failure patients with dilated uh, mitral valve annuluses really have not proven to be beneficial long term. Uh, if you have ASD or PFOs, uh, then uh, those uh, generally uh, will need to be closed. You can really do many of these procedures through a, uh, a hemisternotomy, uh, but if you, uh, as you accumulate more concomitant procedures, I think that it's probably easiest to do them through a sternotomy. Also, uh, if a patient has COPD, I think that uh, sternotomy approach may be better for their pulmonary function post-op rather than doing uh, one or two thoracotomies. Now, uh, another uh, time that you might want to consider not doing a, a uh, minimally or uh, a sternal sparing approach is if you anticipate that you're going to have RV dysfunction. Now, that's a little counterintuitive after I just said that you may have better RV function uh, by doing a sternal sparing approach, but if you really have a bad RV, then uh, you may want to anticipate putting uh, your RVAD in centrally rather than using one of the per percutaneous RVADs. Now, in uh, using both the Tandem Life Cardiac Assist and the Impella RP, uh, these are both percutaneous devices that, if you can get them well positioned, uh, are very helpful. Uh, I have found that in patients who have very dilated RVs that you lose real estate in the right ventricle. And after you get your wire in the PA and then you place the device that the, the uh, wire gets pulled back and you end up uh, with the tip of the device sitting just under instead of just through your pulmonary valve. And that can be very frustrating. But in, in, patients, in uh, patients with acute RV dysfunction, then it, it can be much easier to place the device and it can be very helpful. So here you've seen this slide before. This is the cardiac assist tandem device. And they did come out with a longer version now to help uh, with those patients with dilated RVs. And uh, this um, uh, is a uh, schematic and a x-ray of a patient with a tandem uh, not a tandem, a um, Impella RP showing uh, the femoral approach with the uh, tip of the device in the uh, PA, and there's a picture of the tandem of the uh, Impella RP. So now uh, we've had some discussion of RV failure, so I'll, I will run through this uh, fairly quickly. So there are clinical predictors predictors of RV failure, uh, which have been alluded to. Uh, non-ischemic uh, etiology, uh, female gender, both the very young and the old, uh, the need for uh, mechanical support or mechanical ventilation pre-op, reduced sternotomy, low body surface area. 
emergent operation and previous mechanical support. Echo predictors, dilated tricuspid annulus, severe TR, uh, TAPSI, uh, dilated LV, uh, RV-LV ratios, uh, RV ratios, RV peak strain, uh, and hemodynamic uh, parameters of elevated right atrial pressure. And uh, I will repeat something that Dr. Eisen uh, mentioned, that I, I think the CVP wedge ratio can be very helpful in pre-op assessment. Uh, also, RV stroke work, work index. And if you have a low mean PA uh, with a uh, high CVP and a uh, uh, high wedge can be an indicator of uh, poor RV function with a low cardiac index. Uh, and we've discussed uh, the lab uh, findings that suggest uh, you may have issues with RV failure. Uh, elevated bilirubin, creatinine, elevated BUN, uh, INR, and uh, elevated liver function tests. Uh, also low platelet count and elevated uh, natriuretic peptide and white count. Now, uh, these have also been discussed, uh, risk prediction models. There are a lot of them because none of them are really helpful. Uh, again, the uh, destination therapy risk score, Fitzpatrick score, the uh, RV uh, ventricular failure risk score, uh, Dracos uh, at the University of Utah, uh, Wang uh, HeartMate 2 risk score uh, have all uh, been helpful to guide you, but not really uh, reliable. It's difficult to predict which patients are going to have RV failure. Uh, at uh, Hahnemann, uh, all patients who we put uh, an LVAD in, and for that matter, all patients that we do a transplant on, get inhaled nitric oxide and uh, get IV milrinone. Uh, we use nasiratide selectively. I tend to use it more in the transplant patients because it helps uh, mitigate the effects of the um, uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Um, Tricuspid repair, I, I've discussed that. Mitral repairs, I generally don't do uh, in these patients. Uh, there are some uh, surgeons who are proponents of it, uh, saying that uh, if you have significant mitral regurgs, that it can help RV function down the line. Uh, I'm not sure that I believe that, but I put it on here uh, since that has been uh, discussed uh, in case reports. Now, levosimendin is not available in the U.S., uh, but it's used extensively in Europe. Uh, it's very similar to milrinone, and I think it is very helpful for RV dysfunction. Uh, it has um, uh, been shown uh, to not have the systemic vasodilatory effects of uh, milrinone with similar uh, inotropic and chronotropic effects for the RV. Inhaled prostacyclin can be helpful. Uh, it, uh, I don't believe uh, anecdotally in my experience it's as useful as uh, inhaled nitric oxide, but we will use it in patients who are extubated. Now one thing that uh, we do see in both the transplant and VAD patients is vasoplegia. Uh, it's difficult to define, but uh, I think sur surgeons uh, will tell you that they know it when they see it. And uh, it's when you're on pump and when you're uh, post uh, pump and you have refractory hypotension. And heart failure patients are a setup for it, both uh, intra op and post op, because they're on all these vasodilatory agents in order to treat their, their heart failure and uh, to help your right heart function. Uh, also, when you've been on mechanical support uh, with devices, uh, whether you've been on uh, an impella. A and just to make a quick aside here, if you have a patient that you're not sure if the RV function is going to be adequate for a durable device uh, and they have some renal insufficiency, I think it is, it, it is helpful to put an impella 5.0 in and you can put it in axillary uh, approach that the patient can still ambulate. And then you can see if the RV can keep up with it and you can uh, optimize your renal function prior to going ahead with a durable device. Uh, so when you, however, when you have patients on continuous flow devices preoperatively, 
then they uh, do tend to have more uh, issues uh, with vasoplegia. Now, it's very difficult to treat. Uh, there really is no, no treatment, and you can't really avoid it because all these patients are a setup for it. So you're going to try and optimize volume while protecting your RV. You're going to put them on pressors, and again, when you put them on pressors, then that's going to potentially hurt your RV function. Uh, and also, potentially, it's going to hurt uh, your uh, function of your continuous flow pump, whether it's uh, the, a uh, HeartMate 2 or a HeartMate 3 or a uh, Hardware or a Jarvik. Uh, but you, you need to maintain perfusion. So I always start with vasopressin because it uh, is the least uh, arrhythmogenic. It's a hormone, so uh, it's not going to affect the... Uh, my cardiac function. Uh, and then I'll use uh, Neo and I'll use uh, Levofed. Now, methylene blue uh, IV I've used uh, and had intermittent success with. Some patients will respond nicely to it. Other patients will have no response. But their response is generally transitory, but it may be enough in order to get them through the acute perioperative phase. So uh, post-op for uh, continuous flow devices, uh, as far as anticoagulation goes, uh, early on we uh, would bridge everybody. Then uh, we got out of the habit of bridging patients and no longer bridge them with heparin. And I think that that's been part of the issue with the uh, incidence of thrombosis uh, in the HeartMate twos. I think that uh, when you don't bridge, you potentially set up uh, a, uh, some early fibrin stranding within the pump that leads to thrombosis down the line. So uh, I have been going back to bridging uh, uh, more often uh, with heparin. Now aspirin, we used to uh, just use 81 milligrams. Uh, studies from Europe have uh, suggested that we should be using 100 milligrams or greater. In Europe, the aspirin comes in 50 milligram doses, and I think that's where the 100 milligram recommendations come from. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we have 81 and uh, uh, 320 uh, milligrams. So I've uh, been using two baby aspirin or two of the 81 milligram aspirins for the, uh, for the patients. Uh, the INRs, we've been keeping a little higher uh, in the 2.5 to 3.5 range. Uh, although, again, that has to be uh, cautioned uh, against the uh, risk of bleeding and stroke. I think by keeping the mean pressures low, uh, and in the hardware patients, uh, we try and keep them uh, 60 to 70 means. And uh, the cardiologists in Europe have told me that they will uh, put the patients on any hypertensive medications until they become uh, symptomatic and then they'll back off. And the other uh, important thing to do is to get frequent echoes so that uh, you optimize your volume status and you optimize your speeds. So I think that by uh, adhering to these uh, practices, and I think Dr. Hankins will probably talk more in detail about these, uh, you can mitigate the incidence of pump thrombosis, stroke, and GI bleeding. And, I have to hand it to Dr. Hankins and uh, Dr. Eisen that uh, we see uh, very low incidence uh, of these issues, as well as a very low incidence of driveline infection. And that, that also uh, is uh, uh, due to our uh, VAD coordinators as well. So the field of mechanical support is in rapid flux. Uh, new devices become available while we're still determining management strategies for the devices we have. The Intermax Registry is helping to determine best uh, practices. So we need to optimize the choice of the device, the surgical approach, uh, optimize periop hemodynamics and RV function uh, and uh, for the uh, individual uh, needs of the patient. So as uh, the uh, hockey playoffs are going on now, and for those of you who are keeping track, uh, the Penguins beat uh, the Senators today in Game 7 of the Conference Finals, and so uh, the uh, Pittsburgh uh, Penguins will be in the Finals against Nashville. 
but Wayne Gretzky, famous hockey player, said, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. And so in similar fashion, uh, we need to uh, optimize uh, our patients with the best devices that we have available and uh, work with our engineers to improve the devices and uh, move uh, to where uh, the engineering and uh, the puck is going. So I'll, I'll end here and uh, I guess we'll take questions at the end.